ethical concerns. So doing that. So we have to set all of that aside and sort of get into the ancient text itself. So what did the author of Genesis 1 believe? And then I'm more interested in why he believed what he did. What did the author of Genesis 2 believe? Why did he believe what he did? How did he support his belief in the writing of his text? What literary techniques did he use to, to some extent? Okay, so let me, let, me, let me run through a couple things that I talk more in more detail in my book about that. So on the public realm, usually when people talk about contradictions between Genesis 1 and 2, we hear that on the one hand, um, what's the order here? But anyhow, a plants and animals all get created before man and woman get created in the image of God. And obviously the, 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 the more glaring contradiction is in Genesis 2. No, we have earth, then man, then plants, and then animals, and then women gets created separately. And it's a very drastic different creation uh, 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 um, account. Uh, let me go, let me, let me just detail a couple more of these uh, more, um, right, uh, Genesis 1 lays out a, a, a calendar system, and I'll talk about why the author does that. It's a seven-day creant, but what the author is doing, he's creating a calendar, and basically he's saying, boom, this calendar was created by the creator.god, and it's embedded in the, the creation, so everything has a specific day. Genesis 2 starts off with, on the same day God made earth and sky, he also created plants, animals, and women. Now, that didn't happen in Genesis 1. So then your apologist comes along and tries to brush these claims off. So the apologist is not interested in saying, hmm, why did this particular author, well, the apologist probably doesn't even know there's a different author here, but why does this text sort of express a different ideal? That's, that, that is the answer of a child coming into the text, uh, an empty slate. We don't have any a priori uh, assumptions about the text. And so basically the apologists will try to respond to this on, on two different ways, two different ways that deny what Genesis 1 was doing or the author of Genesis 1. So on the one hand, you can't understand, uh, so this is Genesis 2 verse 4. You can't understand this literally. On the same day God created earth and sky, he created man, plants, and animals, having just read Genesis 1. That didn't happen. So then the apologists will say, okay, we must interpret this figuratively. And all the, there also, you deny what Genesis 1 was creating. If you read Genesis 1, the author is adamant about setting up specific days where events happen. I mean, the whole daytime is adamant. It's specific. There's a rhetorical device of repetition happen. To say that the same author later uses the term figuratively is, is, just, is just defaming this particular author. Uh, so that's another contradiction. Uh, in one country, in Genesis 1, the earth, in Genesis verse 9, 10, when God creates earth, it emerges from the primordial waters that have been made into seas and oceans. So the, the text says, and let the earth appear, uh, as it were, or be visible. So earth, as life-sustaining substance earth, emerges up from the waters below, and it's completely fecund in other words it's it's fertile i mean it's it, it has water all around it in genesis 2 the earth at creation is very different it's barren there is no man to till it and there is no water source to give it water so the image of earth is is radically different um right in the first creation account man and women is created in the image of god and i'll talk about why our authors sort of uh are presented it that way in the second creation account, the author is making a more elaborate theological and what scholars call ideological uh, acclaim. So if you read the second account, the Hebrew word for man is Adam, and the Hebrew word for ground or earth is Adama. Only in the second account, uh, I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll be more specific. So basically, we have a creation account. So our second, Genesis 2 tells us, the Hebrew tells us, Yahweh, the verb used is fashioned, formed, molded from the Adama, Adam. So it's, a, it's an interesting story. So, so now we're here with a culture. So basically, Kyle, Steve, listeners, imagine you're living in a culture where the livelihood of most of the men, if, if you're uneducated, is agriculture. So we have an agricultural community. This storyteller is writing a story that explains why man, life, is bound to the earth. 
basically because in the beginning, God, Yahweh, molded Adam from the Adama. So in Hebrew, it's a, it's a story that tells us not only what man is made of, the substance, earth, but also linguistically, my name, Adam, is the same as the earth, Adama. Ah. Uh, so this sort of defines man as in an intrinsic relationship with the earth. Now, what happens later in this story, just to go through this, now man is alone. And God scratches his head and says, so, so I'm, 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 I'm dramatizing a little bit of the story to bring some humor in. Man says, okay, man needs a companion or a life partner or a helper is actually what the Hebrew text says. God says, I will fashion animals, the same verb, yatsar, it means to fashion mold, from the Adama and bring them to Adam so that he can find a corresponding helper for him. So this is an interesting text, actually, if you look at it. Again, it's all fascinating what these authors are doing. It really is. So man is created from the substance earth, Adama. God now creates a bunch of animals from the same substance, Adama, and brings them forward to man. And he's supposed to sort of identify the same essence in one of the animals and have a lifetime partner. The text tells us then that God failed in doing that. So this author was comfortable in presenting God in those particular terms. And, and we can talk about that as a talking point later. And now what Yahweh must do is fashion his partner, not from the same substance that man was created, but now from the substance of man himself. So then we get the story that Adam was uh, under, under sleep and from his rib, uh, Eve was created. So then once we get the story, uh, another Hebrew word, so man is Adam, but also another Hebrew word is ish. So that, that, that word can mean man or husband. So then the text tells us that woman, isha, was created or built, the Hebrew word is built, from ish. So this author is really interested in pun and word plays. We don't find any of this in Genesis 1. Adam created from Adama. Isha is created from Ish. So it's, it, it's, com it's completely, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful story. And then in the end, this author, it's also a story of the origins of matrimony. So why is it that man marries a woman? Well, because woman was literally taken from the flesh of man. So it's sort of a, a, a return to essences. Are, are similar you know it's, it's strange so this type it's, of it's, it's, what you're saying just has a ring of truth it's, it's like i hear an apologist give me the narrative that they want to to give from their their perspective which i think you said earlier theologians come with it with the pre-bias they they start with their their conclusion and they want to work the evidence to fit their narrative but when i'm listening to you give a description of how these things came to be and how we understand them today it makes sense there's a ring of truth to it Right, because I've been practicing the deceptive art, Steve, for a long time. <laughs> it's kind of a beautiful story. I mean, it really is. It, it's a, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It from it. It's kind of a beauty. Um, you know, and, and, and the thing is, my sole agenda, and I try telling uh, apologists this, is to the best of my academic ability to present the beliefs and views of the author. I, I'm not concerned with what do I believe about this text or where I'm coming from or how somebody in the 20th century views this. I, I, those are all irrelevant to me. I'm fascinated by ancient culture. I mean, basically, uh, that, that's what I love doing. So my total goal is, is, is to, so when you read Genesis 1, the task is we enter into his worldview and try to understand it. We don't try to explain it with from our scientific worldview or from a later theological interpretive grid that says this is the word of God. Those are all incorrect. And they're, they're doing dishonesty to the text. Our task is to... The text invites us into its worldview. That's uh, that's the challenge. You go in there and, and, and see what this author was up to. It's it's fascinating. So when when it's important to note that too that, that you're not coming at it from a, a like a theist or atheist approach, but that you're just looking at a a text and its contents and what it right. says word for word. There's no you know motive behind what you're right. presenting. Right. You're doing it obje Many objectively. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, many of my friends have said I should write a book titled something like Up the Middle, where I take these theist and atheist arguments and sort of inject where biblical scholars and, – and again, if you had another biblical scholar on here, he'd be shaking his head. Pretty much this is mainstream scholarship. We all know this and we all agree about it, not because we all believe and think the same thing, but because the text is telling us this. I mean this is what the text tells us. I have a random question, you, and you may not be able to answer this. It's just something that I've always um, wondered yeah. about, but why do you think that – the author of, of Genesis 2 chose that Eve should be fashioned from a rib. You know, that's just kind of a an odd, I think, right. way to... I think, 
I think there's an answer for that, Kyle. I don't off the top of my head know the Hebrew word for rib, but again, I guess it would be, uh, so, so we say etymology. So language is used sometimes to mean something. So in the ancient world, everybody's name actually had a meaning. So I think the word rib probably had a specific meaning for this author that was attached to some element of, of woman or womanhood or something like that, I imagine. Maybe that's where the name Reba comes from. <laughs> do, do you think that was the uh, the Adam and Eve story came from, like, obviously the, the initial one with Lilith was his wife? And we have discussed that before in a prior episode uh, that that Lilith was his wife. She had a fling with some arch uh, angel and, and she was demonized and all the offspring of her is now demons. Is it was that the predecessor to the Adam and Eve story? Or is there kind of a relationship there? No. So the, a story like that would come after. centuries later. It would come actually. afterwards. Okay. And right. Right. And I don't know. One of the reasons is right when you get, I mean, the, the, and, and again, the, the Christian apologists, again, our sole goal is to understand the text and their beliefs, but the oldest layers of the Bible and the Genesis 2 story is much older than Genesis 1, even though Genesis 1 is first, so it's a little bit complicated. But in the older theological layers of the Hebrew Bible, the, there is no Satan ca character. I mean, there's a Hebrew word, Satan, and usually Hebrew tra translate this with a slow S, but the Satan character is presented as an adversary that's what the word satan means to mankind he's not an adversary to yahweh and in a lot of texts like uh, the one that comes off my exodus 4 11 so yahweh so the author of this text to put it in perspective has yahweh say i'm in charge of making somebody blind i'm in charge of diseases and plague i'm in charge of all that there's a passage in isaiah where the author has yahweh says I'm in charge of creating what's light. I'm in charge of what's creating what's evil and bad. So the theology, again, is that Yahweh is 100% sovereign. He's in control. You enter later this idea of Satan, a separate entity emerged. Uh, so that's a, that, whole, that whole theology. So you read the book of Leviticus. And you ask, well, where is the enemy, to use that word, the enemy of God in that text? There is no demons. There are no Satans. There are their sin and illnesses. That's that's this is a priestly concept. So so again, the Bible tells us that later theologies were changed. We move from a theology where Yahweh is viewed as 100 percent sovereign to a theology now where we have Satan explains the evil part of, of life and, and, and the temptation of men to do bad things. Et so all that Satan and all the hell stuff came long afterwards. Like our, our, our interpretation of hell, when we, when, when people say, Oh, you're condemned right. to hell. Uh, I see a lot of parallels like Dante's Inferno. And I think a lot of things that came right. from, uh, narratives, li actual literature that had, had kind of molded the way society thinks of what hell would be. Cause I, I, I've always thought the same thing with Satan. That was Satan. That was, uh, the adversary. Um, it wasn't, um, uh, this character that was, literally against god it was a, a judgment of some right. kind right 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 so um i remember seeing a debate some time ago between some jewish religious people some christian one and, and sam harris was there uh, representing the atheist side and the debate question was misplaced do you believe in the afterlife and again from a scholarly perspective going back to the literature i can actually show you when in the literature the idea of an afterlife was created by man. What historical circumstances prompted the creation of that religious belief? So a lot of these things are pretty much fascinating. So if you go back to the Hebrew Bible, there's only one verse that alludes to some sort of afterlife existence, and that's in the text Daniel. And the text Daniel was written around 165, 168 BC. So it is the youngest of the text of the Hebrew Bible. And I would surmise, now this is just a guess, I haven't really gone into the literature, but at this particular time, you know, Alexander the Great conquers the whole world in the third century BC, connecting them. And I think Egyptian ideas of an afterlife sort of spread, Greek ideas of an afterlife. And I think the Hebrews in, or the Jewish community was later um, uh, influenced by this. But also, uh, Steve, it's much more complicated. Uh, and, and again, maybe I'll talk about an interesting contradiction in the text uh, also that sort of comes back to this Satan or, or afterlife point. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, there's a theology of the land. So in the ancient world, the worst thing that could happen to your people. So imagine Israel is just a small country. They have the superpower Egypt here on the bottom and Babylon and Mesopotamia up here. And a lot of times 
Israel was just a tromping ground with the